All right, guys, today we're going to talk about one of the hardest skills in volleyball, and it's easily one of the most undertaught skills. This is going to be a pretty involved video, so make sure you take some time and really try to understand this. Maybe even watch it twice if you can, because if you can get this down, it's really going to help you a lot, both defensively, offensively, blocking literally everything. So reading a setter is difficult. There's a lot that goes into it, and it's done very, very quickly. So you really have to pay attention. Um, so let's start with the basics. You know, the, the, basic, re the basic reading opportunities that we have um, tells us what things to look at when we're talking about reading a setter. The first thing is, where is the pass? We're going to talk about that in a second when we get to here. Um, it's actually the last thing I'm going to talk about. It's extremely involved. The second thing is the setting posture. What's the setter actually look like? What's their body doing that's making them you know, push the ball where they want it to go? The hitter layout, um, something we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, the jumping and regular setting and then the setter up and down. All, this, all these things dictate where the set's actually going to be placed. So let's first off talk about, generally speaking, where's the ball set to? You know, on a team of our caliber, of our level, the, high, the, the, the extremely high high school level, the college level, you know, the intro to D3, D2 college level, where's the ball set? And we're talking specifically front row. We're not getting into Bix or back row or anything along those lines. But generally speaking, from what I have seen, you know, we're going to start to see, give or take, um, the outside receiving about 55% of the balls, the middle receiving about 20% of the balls, and the right side receiving 25 So it's, you know, one out of two, one out of five, you know, uh, I'm sorry, five out of ten, um, you know, two out of, two out of ten, and then maybe two and a half to three out of ten. So if you can get that in your mind, that's generally speaking where the sets are going. And here's the thing, we can't just say that though, because it all is dictated based upon where the pass is, what the setter's comfortable with, what hitters they have, all that kind of fun stuff. So we're gonna step back and run through these individually a little bit so you can kind of get a feeling for it. So pass placement I'm actually gonna to come, to, come back to last because it's the most involved. Setter posture, this is the easiest one. You know, This is when you guys hear me on the bench call where they're setting the ball, I'm looking at based upon where what their body looks like. So I know this diagram is really, really small to see, but you know there are five major sections that I'm looking at on the setter to identify where they're actually setting that ball. The first is their feet. The second is their lower back. The third is their hips and their shoulders together. The fourth is their hands, and the fifth is their head. Um, obviously, ball contact, where the ball is actually being contacted on their body is a big part of that. So I'm going to actually walk through these a little bit. So let's talk about what it looks like when a setter is actually setting the ball at their feet. The first thing is, which way are their feet pointed? Um, I know this seems ridiculous, but a, a novice level coach, the coach's setting will teach their setters to literally point their feet to the pin that they want to set to. So if they're off the net seven or eight feet and their feet are pointed towards outside, then they're probably going outside. If they're pointed like out and maybe 20 feet off the outside, then you're probably thinking they're trying to square up to go opposite. So it's something you have to look for. It's not a huge indicator, but it does help. Um, left, right, you know, how, what's their posture look like? Are they leaning? You know, are they taking a full left, right step so that they can get power? You know, anytime that their feet are together and controlled, you're gonna and not moving, you're gonna see that that set is likely gonna be less of a set. It's gonna be a middle set or a quick back set, something along the lines, because they don't need power. Anytime someone takes in a, you know a step, that left, right, or whatever the case, whatever steps they make, they're attempting to get power when they're setting the ball, and that's something that you will really give you a good indicator that they're going outside with it. Um, and then the last one is, are they balanced? You know, if they're not balanced. They the, the, the great thing about being balanced is it gives you power in every direction. So if I'm balanced and I'm stepping through the ball, I can set the ball back, I can set it forward, I can set it up, I can set it back row. If I'm not balanced and let's say I'm leaning out, this set's gonna be dramatically less powerful. And one of the things that people don't realize about when you're unbalanced is it's gonna take power away from the set naturally, not because the setter wants it to, but if I'm unbalanced and I'm, let's say, you know, splitting two and three, so it's a 20, let's say it's an 18, 20 foot set, and I'm unbalanced trying to set it outside. You got a big outside hitter. Chances are, if I'm unbalanced, that set's not, not only gonna be low, but it's also gonna be inside, which tells you as a blocker, you should probably start your block inside if they're unbalanced, because they, you know, are probably not gonna get the ball where they want to. There are not many setters that can sling a ball 25 feet with just their hands and not being balanced with their shoulders around it. So again, with the feet, we're looking at where are they pointed, are they actually stepping through to get power? That likely indicates the furthest set that they're trying to accomplish. And then balanced. Um, the next thing is their lower back. You know, when we look at a setter, 
the lower back of the setter is very easy. There's one of two positions they can, you know, one of three real positions. They can be in a pressing motion with their lower back, which means their angle's like this, you know, so they're looking to press into something. I'm pretty sure we all know what that means. You can't press in and then go back or press in and go up. It's very difficult. So that ball's going outside. If they're pressing into that and you can see a straight line, I'm sorry, an angled line, maybe 30, 60 degrees, somewhere in there, you're going to see that that ball's going outside. If their posture's pretty straight up, they can go one of two ways. They're going up or they're going back or they have enough power with their hands that they're just going to stand there and then set the ball all the way out. Um, so something that you, you want to see, if they're pressed, they really only have one option. If they're, if they're you know, erect and standing straight up, they have three options, but not nearly the power. If, and this is one of the great things you can see with setters, as soon as you see the shoulders behind their head, so their shoulders are even with their head here, their head here, you know, they're, they're somewhere in that range, but as soon as we start to see our shoulders pull back just a tad bit, and we see an arch in our back, we know that the ball's going back. And you can just completely sacrifice everything else. And one of the big, big indicators of that is when someone is has their weight on their left foot and they press with their right, they're trying to create that arc with their back. So if someone's stepping into it, they're stepping left, right, their weight seems forward, then you're probably going to the outside. If you see them on their left and then they're pressing with their right and you start to see that motion where their hips come forward and their lower back really starts to edge out this way, you know that they're going back. So super easy. Hips and shoulders. Um, you know, one of the things that we've taught, we learn more and more as coaches is all we want you to do to set the ball is to be square to the, to the left side. We don't care if it's square to the pin or square to the net. We just want you square to the left side so that it's really deceiving as to where you're going to be setting the ball. So if a setter, let's say they come seven feet off the net, we talked about this with their feet. If they literally, if the pin's out there and they literally square up to it, in order to set the ball back, they'd have to take the ball from here and pull the ball backwards against the grain of their shoulders. So when we're talking about squaring our hips and shoulders, if they're, you know, if you see them even pull off as if they're open to the court, they're likely going to be thinking back set here because they're trying to get the ball tighter to the, to the net. Now, as setters, we have to know that our job is not to do that. We want to make sure that we square up to the court, to the outsides, but not to the pin. And that's a mistake I made for as a coach for a long time. Um, so making sure that we know where their actual body is facing is likely where the ball's going to be going. Um, then you have the hands. Um, the hands themselves, are they high or low? Down here, where are we going with the ball? Simple. It's going to be a middle set. No question about it. You can't take the trajectory and then push out and up at the same time. You know, if their hands are high, they're likely trying to get their hands to contact early so that they can go backwards or up. Um, you know, if their hands are in front of their body here, this ball is very difficult to send this way. So they're likely pressing out with that ball. So you have to see, like, outside, middle, right side. That simple. So if you can see kind of a movement of the hand, you can automatically identify where they're going. So if a player is running up to it and you see their hands starting here, and it's almost behind their head, to send the ball outside, they'd have to step their body back and then release, which some do, but more times than not, you're going to find that if their hands are in front of their head here, they're going outside. If they're, you know, kind of just chilling right at their forehead, they're probably going up with it. If their thumbs and their f index fingers start to drop, so it starts to flatten out your hands a little bit, you can tell that they're going backwards with it. Um, and that's what we talked about with the front and behind. Front, behind, flat. And that's what I like to think when I'm, when I'm trying to identify where a setter is going is hands in front of me and it looks like I'm going outside, I'm probably going outside. If they're flat, um, then I'm probably going up. If I'm starting to kind of dip back, almost like my shoulder with my index fingers, I'm going back. Um, eyes, this is the easiest one. Pay attention. You know, when, you're, when we're serving the ball, just look at them. Watch. But even before you even serve the, serve the ball, look at the hitter that they're looking at. There's a good chance that, you know, bad setters indicate a lot of times where they're actually going with the ball. And that's something to pay attention to. Also, as they set the ball, they, you know, a, a team that's not really fluid, a setter will, instead of listening for the audible call and just assuming that the hitter is going to be there, a lot of times they'll look at the hitter. So they'll actually, you know, what a setter should do is they should, they should read the pass, get to the spot, check the blocker, which none of them do, and then they should just release the ball. It should not be worrying about where they're actually setting the ball to. But most setters, what they'll actually do is they'll not read the passer at all. They'll try to get there. They'll get their, their body close. Then they'll take a quick look at the hitter and see if they're there, and then they'll chuck the ball. That's why it's so uncomfortable as a setter that they don't know what they're doing because the order of operation of how they communicate or how they look at the game is so wrong. 
Um, so the eyes are a big one. And the ball contact is really easy. You know, the further away you are, it's just like when you hit. You know, when you hit a ball, if your, your, your power zone's in here, anytime you get below outside to the left or to the right, you lose power. Think of it in the same presence as setting. Our power zone is here, okay? When I get up here, or I get up here, or I get out here, or out here, or down here, I lose power. It's that simple. You know, especially when we reach our hands high. When we reach our hands high, I guarantee you that 90% of those sets are going to be middle sets. They're going to be one or two balls directly in the middle of the court. And, and it's so easy to range because as soon as they go up, you know that they, they can't start from a lower point. There's no extension. It's just like hitting. If I only bring my shoulder back this far, I can't get power. If I bring it all the way back, I can get power. So if someone goes up to the net and their hand's like this starting, you know it's a roller tip. Same thing with setting. If you look here, if they get down here or out to the left or out to the right or up high, especially up high, it's a dead giveaway that that's going to be a middle set. Um, so let's move on a little bit. The ball contact we talked about, that's you know the height of the, the actual pass and when they contact the ball. A good setter will actually let the ball come down to their hands above their forehead and try to start in a neutral position regardless of what they do. Um, so let's talk about hitter layout. Um, it's real simple. They're going to want to set their better hitter. You know, one of the things about us being a setter is we want to look good. And we, the way that we look good is by delivering the ball to the people that make us look good and get those, you know, assist numbers up and things along those lines. So as long as the middle is identifying who that VIP hitter is, you have a pretty good chance of knowing where this ball is going to go. Um, pretty important. Jumping a regular setting. Um, regular setting, conducive of consistent setters. You know, when you stay on the ground, one of your biggest – biggest advantages as a setter or defensive player is the ground. You have, tra you have traction that you can move faster. Um, when I stay on the ground, you know, I'm going to get a much more consistent set. That's really what it comes down to. When I jump, the reason that I jump for the first thing you need to understand is to make sure I keep hold the blockers. Um, it doesn't really give me an advantage as far as the technique of the set is concerned unless you're really, really good. Um, but it, you know, it, it speeds up the offense just a tad bit, but not substantially to the point that I would sacrifice my technique. Um, but if I am jump setting, there's a few things you need to learn about jump setting. Is One is you're probably closer to the net. Okay, So there's going to be some discomfort there, which means they're going to set the comfortable set, the VIP hitter. Super easy. And it's going to be high. So you're going to have time. And what that means is a blocker is you have the capability to really read the set. So if they're jump setting and you know that they're going to have to go to their comfortable hitter, but you want to make sure you still block the middle, um, we can block the middle and assume that that set's probably going to be a forced pretty high ball. That being said... Jump sets, generally speaking, take away from traction of the left-right step process. And if they take away from traction, that means they have less power. It's very much like putting them in an, in an unbalanced state. So if they're jumping in the air, the max momentum that they can get is a combination of their arms here and their hands finishing here. So they have 18 inches to work with maximum as compared to stepping through and getting power and momentum with their hips, the springing of their calves, and releasing the ball. If they're jump setting, you can guarantee that the ball will be set less powerfully and it will be in a less consistent manner. So as a blocker, you have to be ready for a, to set to block a ball that's eight feet off the net or super tight or whatever the case may be. But if they are jump setting, you really have to understand that if someone's trying to jump set that ball 22 feet to the outside, that's going to end up looking more like a 32, and we should not be blocking the outside. If they get it out there, great, but I guarantee you the timing of that outside is going to be manipulated based upon that jump set. So it's important to remember. Uh, as a setter up and down, um, one thing I learned, especially with power setters, which are people that like to control the game, is if they're up and if the if the setter's up, they're gonna they're gonna look at their three hitters and they're gonna say, at what point do I become a better attacker than one of these three people? Is it a better opportunity for me to get a point than back setting? So look for the weak hitters and identify the chance of them actually pushing the ball over on two is higher than them actually setting this particular player. Then we can cheat the block. And obviously, you know, our five defender is going to be in there covering that anyway, so I'm not worried about that. But setters that, generally speaking, if they're up, they treat the game differently. They're more, um, more prone to be do doing some crazy things with the ball. And that's just because they're up and they don't have to worry about it. If they're down, you can assume that they're going to be in a very controlled, we're going outside, we're going middle, we're going right side type of mentality. So the whole concept as a setter, it doesn't really help you with reading to it with the extent of you can understand more. If they are up, they're going to be a little bit more playing athletically and open. They're going to be kind of like a quarterback that, you know, the, the, the coach isn't giving them plays. They're just letting them call plays on the field and they'll know how to process. 
but when they're down, they're going to be at a very, this is the play we're calling type mentality, very structured and what they're going to be doing. So it, it, what it tells you is that the person that's on the ground is going to be a little bit more consistent in running the play the way they should be. Um, so you can kind of use that as a precursor to where they're going to set the ball. Okay, this ball should go to the outside, so I'm going to set it outside type of thing. They're probably not going to be nearly as variable. And it also means when they get put tight on the net, that set's going to be probably much less consistent and much higher. Just because they're, you know, their coach is just saying, hey, if you get it tight, just get under the ball and chuck the ball up and give our outsides an opportunity to swing at it. So something to keep in mind. Um, last thing we're going to talk about is going to be pass placement. And this is probably, you know, if you really want to start anywhere where the ball is being set, it has nothing to do with the setter. Let's identify where they actually pass the ball and where the ball can go to as a hitter. Um, so we have three diagrams here. You can think of them going along this way. I know I kind of did that opposite, but these would be considered good passes. Boom, boom, well, relatively good, okay? They are great passes. They have good passes in the middle, which is like your 13-foot line. So it's seven-foot line, 13-foot line, anywhere under the seven, you know, 13-foot line, and then back to third of the court. So what this is telling you is this is a great, these are good pa great passes, good passes, bad passes, and where can they actually run an offense? The numbers in blue are associated to how many hitters they can actually set. And the, the uh, X's, the green X's without a circle are basically viable options. The green X's with circles are really the, the hitters that would have a tough time hitting this ball. So let's look at the great passes. This is, hey, a team's really passing as well, which means, first off, it's not being a bum and serve the ball harder, okay? Uh, you know I'm going to push that. But if they pass the ball perfectly, they have three to four hitting options, you know, in the two, three, four, and the five, okay? And maybe even the six. So it could be actually three or five. If they pass in the middle of the court, still everybody has an option. This this set in two becomes a little bit harder just because they're being dragged in and it becomes more complicated for the middle. This actually is a, a good opportunity to get the middle out. If we can get them to pass in the middle of the court, a lot of times the middle will be taken out because they have to decide left or right and it gets rid of a lot of work, a lot of ball, but it's not ideal. And then this shot is good. It's, it's the best pass or it's the worst pass for them to accomplish a side out on because it takes away pretty much the right side hitter unless that setter can set them up 23 feet, 24 feet. Um, so you can see where they naturally go based upon where those serves are. Then the good passes um, off the net a little bit, you know, on the right side of the court, you're going to have a lot of trouble hitting that right side setter or that right side hitter. Um, setting the middle is possible, but only if you run it like we do, which is a blue ball. You know, you're setting a 32 or you're setting a two ball in the middle that's just set from 17 feet away. You're next going to, you can't run anything on the right side, then you have your back row on the left side. So got nine times out of ten, this ball is going to be, you know, a five by five ball on the outside. Then you've got your middle of the court, dead center of the court, takes up the middle. This is a great scenario for us, something you should learn. If the ball is passed 13 feet off the middle of the court, they're not running a middle attack. We will. We'll run a blue or we'll run a red or we'll run a two, one of the two of them. But... Most teams will not run a middle. They will sacrifice the middle as soon as the ball is passed to the middle of the court and off the, and off the, uh, the net about 15 feet. You still have the outside options, the right side option. The right side option does become a lot dicier. Um, it's, it's doable with a good right side, but the ball's coming over their shoulder, and then they're finding a way. If they're going to hit this, it's going to be relatively high, and it's going to be the one, unless it's on accident, and they're probably going to try then. Um, then you have the pass to the left side. One of our best opportunities is when they pass the ball off the net to the left side. You know, it, it can't go to the five hitter. This is likely going to be a big set or a pipe set because they can't go be directly behind the outside. They can try, but it's going to be a roll shot. The middle comes out unless they're running a two, which most teams don't at our level, and the right side would be a 30-foot set, thirty foot set. So it's very unlikely. That's why you have one to two hitters there. This is a great opportunity for us. Um, then you have the back right. You know, you lose... The two attacker, the three attacker, you're probably losing because you're not going to run a B from the back corner, and you lose the uh, four attacker just because it's such so long of a set. You're likely setting the back row there or setting a five by five on the outside, one to two hitters. Um, bit middle back of the court, again, anything in the middle, they lose that middle attack. I love that. All right, you still have the outside opportunity there or in the back row, um, the five. The four becomes difficult. The, the two becomes very difficult, but it is possible. We should be running balls to the two from the six if we pass the ball there. Um, our libero will really be able to take advantage of that process. And this is obviously our best opportunity. We take out all of our left side hitters when the ball is passed that far off. 
we take out the middle completely because there's no way that hitting that ball on the right side it would be a mm -hmm. miracle. So as you can see, the great thing about this is not only does it tell us where the setters are actually going to be, where they're actually going to put the ball, but it also gives us an idea. Where do we want people to pass this ball? Because it gives us now a certain serving strategy. As you see, to the right side of the court, always fairly solid. To the middle of the court, eh, you know, you have some issues. To the left side of the court, you do really, really well. So this is why serving from one, two, five is a really good serve because generally speaking, they can't make that angle. So it stays on the left side of the court and really debilitates them. Um, there's a lot that you can do with this. Kind of get an idea of what you're, how it's gonna happen, what you wanna try to accomplish when you're reading setters. What's gonna happen before it, end, and it ends up happening? And you can use all of these variables to do that, to try to figure that process out. But really it's gonna come down to, you need to watch more game film and apply these processes. And when you watch really good teams, a lot of this stuff goes out because the setters are so good that they can set 40 foot sets from anywhere. So a lot of this stuff goes out the window. But if you watch high school or, or you know some, some D2, D3 college volleyball, you'll see a lot of these things really do apply. Take some time, review it, get a good understanding of how to read a setter, and then start applying as you play. Really watch these things happen. Thanks, guys.